So thank you very much. Uh, I'm pleased to be here today. Uh, last time I recall was 10 years ago. And uh, I'd like to talk about uh, the work uh, mostly by my uh, recently graduated students, uh, one uh, uh, last month and the other one year ago. And uh, I'm going to take advantage of the, uh, of the work beyond in the meaning uh, of this conference. So what I'm going to do is to talk about mainly high performance computing. The motivation, of course, remains uh, turbulence that we are all interested in. I uh, first acknowledge uh, computer time uh, provided by uh, National Science Foundation in the U.S. Uh, through the machine called Blue Waters. And also we have had, uh, you know, in, the, in the current calendar year, we have the time uh, awarded by the Department of Energy. So uh, uh, I think the word scaling is something that uh, we all in turbulence uh, knew uh, when we were a student. Uh, at first it was very great to me, what, was, what, is that, what does that mean? I'm going to talk about three particular meanings of this uh, uh, today. One is a uh, thing about if you look for scale similarity, uh, large unit simulations, say, we always ask how do things uh, scale with the Reynolds number? And uh, Richardson scaling, uh, uh, Kumo Gov, they talk about inertial range. And if you are talking about uh, uh, bound delays, they talk about uh, uh, inner, uh, inner, inner scaling, outer scaling, and, 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 and so forth. And the other kind of meaning I'm talking about is uh, in, uh, in the sense of computing. Uh, what we mean uh, strong scaling is uh, if I give you a computer twice as many cores, can you solve the problem is half, in half of, the, half of the time? So uh, in other words, how, many, how much time do we need uh, as we increase the CPU call count by a certain factor? And the idea is that if we now have a big computer, we can solve the same problem faster. Of course, that's not the only thing that we want to do. Uh, we, after all, don't we want to uh, uh, simulate higher Reynolds number, uh, higher speed number, and, and, uh, and higher, uh, well, well, higher Reynolds number in general. So we want to do, talk about uh, also, uh, also weight scaling. OK, so, so weight scaling is the idea that uh, how, if we increase the problem size, uh, how, how much resource would, uh, would we need? Uh, basically, we want to uh, use a big computer to do a bigger calculation. Uh, okay, after all, we don't want to stay at the, at the same resolution level all the time we want to go up, and that's the idea of rescaling. And in the end, yes, uh, we, we find that uh, if we, to, uh, to give uh, better answers to question one, it seems that we need to figure out what to do with, uh, with the other uh, two uh, types of scaling uh, from, a com from a computing point of view. I'm going to talk about uh, uh, briefly uh, uh, two different algorithms. Uh, one is to track uh, hundreds of millions of fluid particles, and that's the Lagrangian viewpoint. I mean, uh, as we might know, uh, this is very uh, important for the study of dispersion. And basically, uh, we have uh, reasons uh, why we need uh, so many particles. Uh, uh, generally, that increases the Reynolds number, and also uh, uh, recently we talked about we have a paper on on, on backward relative dispersion. Basically, instead of start, instead of starting from a particle at a certain location, find out where it's going to go. We say this particle and that particle, where did you come from? And it looks and it, and it turns out that we need a large very very large num number of particles for that for that kind of work. And also, uh, we're going to talk about uh, 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 passive scalars, of course, uh, very relevant to the theme of, uh, of turbulent mixing. And uh, I'm going to focus on the regime of low diversity or high speed number. Very, uh, they're, very, they're very common in liquids, and most important, most important application perhaps is, is in the ocean. And the difficulty is that the fluctuation of ice as a, as a so-called bachelor scale, which is much more than, more, smaller than common gold. So frequently, we are forced into a compromise of a state uh, do we keep the Reynolds number high and aim for a relatively very high uh, speed number um, so and, and say live with a modest uh, speed number or we say that let's uh, just hold the Reynolds number there and just uh, focus on increasing the, the uh, speed number. So, um, okay. So first we'll talk about particle tracking. Uh, the equation of motion that we know is very simple. The uh, wake of change of position is the velocity. Uh, and the velocity is obtained by uh, uh, taking the Eulerian velocity field at the measure at the instantaneous particle position. Uh, I have to say first, in experiment, they, uh, they, uh, they, uh, I think people still use this equation, but, but, they, uh, but they would do it in a different way. So in experiments, uh, typically, uh, 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 
there will be uh, some mechanism to sense the positions of a certain uh, number of choices. And if we have confidence in whether those choices are at two e between two instances of time, we differentiate and get, and, uh, and get the velocity. In DNS, however, we first actually use equation two. We first uh, obtain an Eulerian, do an Eulerian DNS, and then uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, we can specify initial positions in great forwards in time. And uh, every time instant, we first get the, uh, we, we basically uh, uh, evaluate this equal sign by, 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 by interpolation. And uh, we have to have a high L order of accuracy as well as differentiability, especially uh, we might want to differentiate the, uh, the uh, interpolated velocity as a function of time. But we, uh, and uh, th these are the basics about free particles. Of course, uh, uh, similar uh, ideas arise uh, for, for inertial particles and Brownian particles, molecular motion, where uh, well, on the right hand side there would be some additional terms. Uh, uh, for, for, for equation one. And the particle count is mostly driven by uh, sampling con um, uh, consideration. I will get, get to that later on. So uh, let's uh, look at it. Let's take a basic look at what, the, what is the challenge uh, we want to simulate other tropic turbulence. Uh, uh, you, most of the time, uh, we prefer uh, pseudo spectral methods uh, uh, for, for the sake that is it a, a scheme proven to be of high accuracy. But, and let's say that we have n cube grid points. Now, when we have to divide the solution domain, you have to divide the solution domain um, among, the, among the different processes. So uh, on the sketch on the left hand side, we can take FFT in X. So FFT is a, is a global operation uh, that, can be, uh, that, must, uh, that requires a complete line of data in core. What about you want to take FFT in other directions? So we have to redivide the data as, as, as is suggested here. So we have to do a transfer. The problem of the transport or the challenge of the transport is that we requires all-to-all -all communication. Basically, every, MPR, every part of the process is going to uh, send information to every other one and at the same time receive information from all the others. There, there are some ways in which uh, we, can, uh, we can make, the, make this uh, work more efficiently. We can choose one of the domains if we have a so-called uh, uh, two-dimensional process agreed. Uh, here, R and C represent some is what we send rows and columns. And uh, if we uh, choose a number of rows uh, to be the same as the number of nodes, by the way, what is a node? Uh, essentially, uh, most of the uh, uh, high performance computing platforms now consist of multi core processors. And for, for the machine that we call Blue Waters, uh, actually, the number of cores is 32 per node. And uh, so, because uh, the cores on the node are essentially the same hard, uh, piece of hardware, where you will. So if some communication has to take place, it's just like talking to uh, the next person sitting on the same row as you are, then they will be quick, uh, easier to talk to the people uh, uh, seated uh, in the other side of the room. And in Blue Waters, we also have uh, uh, remote memory addressing uh, that we, I think we'll talk about it uh, just, uh, just a little bit. So uh, let's say cubic branch interpolation. Uh, we prefer to do, uh, use cubic branch because the four border equate and also it generates a smooth approximation. Uh, there are three operations such as suggested by this formula. Uh, um, so uh, we, first, uh, we have to uh, uh, calculate these uh, S uh, PQR here, what we say the three-dimensional uh, spine coefficients. It's written like a, like a basis function uh, 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 representation. And we can, uh, we can solve a system of simultaneous equations to obtain uh, these given spines coefficient. And next, uh, we know that, now, of course, uh, at least at time, going back to time t equal to zero, we know where the particles are. We know what x, y, c coordinates are. And so we can uh, evaluate the one-dimensional basis functions, uh, these uh, uh, b, c, and d, and uh, based on the particle position. Well, those primes are essentially normalized positions, let's say, how, <coughs> how many grid spacings and so forth. And then we have to do, uh, uh, perform this triple summation over 64 uh, contributions. Now, there, there are some problems, some challenges with that, uh, because some, uh, some of, uh, depending on where the particle is, uh, some of these uh, terms going into the summation are going to be on multiple processes. So we have to uh, somehow combine the results over all the parallel processes, and also we, uh, 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 it should, in order to obtain the uh, differentiability properties uh, of cubic spines, uh, for n, n grid, uh, grid points in one direction, we're going to have n plus three. 
uh, uh, spinal efficiency. So how do we divide the network? How do we divide the workload uh, efficiently over the multiple processes? And also, we, uh, when we talk about a very large number of particles, then of course, uh, the memory requirements uh, uh, dictate that we might have to, have to uh, divide those uh, NP particles uh, over the, uh, a certain number of product processes. So um, how do we do that is an important question. Um, one can say that if, let's say that if one part of process is going to keep track of the same particle, same set of particles every time, every time instant. But let's say that if, if we have a, if, if I say that this is something like a, like a, like a subdomain, if at the beginning a particle is inside this subdomain, then this, uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the product, one part of process may hold all the information. But over time, a particle from inside is going to wander up and down, it's going to go everywhere. It's going to go everywhere, and so uh, uh, this uh, original host process will not be able to keep track of it anymore. So, and, and, and as a result of that, if we don't do it carefully, uh, the communication uh, cost essentially overwhelms the entire calculation. So what we have to do is that you should divide up the data uh, based on the instantaneous position. So got to watch every time instant, we, t we figure out we, uh, where the particle is. We, we, we figure out in which subdomain is, is it located. And we will turn over the control for that, uh, or for that particle um, uh, to, that, to, to that particular uh, 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 parallel process. So, uh, so, we have, so we are essentially mapping uh, the, uh, uh, the particle to the MPI process based on the instantaneous, uh, uh, instantaneous position. Now what about if the particle lies close to the boundary? Of course, uh, some information will come from another processor, but then there will be the, the one that is immediately uh, the next neighbor. So, uh, uh, so the uh, communication between this, uh, this uh, uh, subdomain and this subdomain is relatively fast between this one and one which it uh, could be very far off. And uh, we want to also want to um, be able to uh, uh, declare global memory. Um, so uh, in, in high performance computing, uh, we talk about uh, uh, one-sided communication. That is to say that if I send somebody an email, I don't have to suppose that I don't have to wait for that person to, uh, to, to, to read that email. But by some uh, prior agreement, that person has already given me uh, access to a certain part of his or her brain. So once I send a message, already there. It's automatically there, okay? and so that, will, that will be a lot faster. And, and, and unlike uh, part of different methods that we don't use uh, ghost layers, uh, uh, ghost layers is the idea that what about if I give this process uh, some, uh, uh, let it have some information from the neighbors, okay? Uh, uh, and, and it, but then uh, that, uh, that we, uh, we showed in, uh, in the paper that hopefully will be published uh, soon, uh, before the end of the year, that uh, 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 the use of ghost layers will be extremely uh, memory intensive. That we, that, we don't want, that, we, that we don't really want to do. And I said the, uh, the particle can go to another host process, depends on how far it can go. Uh, but if, uh, in, uh, we have a cooler number consider, uh, uh, limit on the, on, the on, on the time step, so that means that every part, each particle can never go beyond one grid spacing. And this is some, uh, this is some pseudo code. Uh, um, I'm going to skip quite a bit of that, but say, Basically, we say that for every particle, every particle, uh, uh, this is a number of particles, so we make some decisions about, uh, well, well, first we can go ahead and evaluate the, uh, the, uh, the basis, uh, well, basis functions, and then we look over two indices, not three, because uh, our solution domains are like this, this. In one of those directions, we have everything. We don't have to, think, we don't have to worry about a particle going, uh, going to the left, and, uh, left or right uh, in, uh, in the way that I post it, only, only front and back and, and top and bottom. And uh, so we, and we have this uh, particular uh, 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 syntax, uh, which is referred to as called wave force one, it's a, uh, it's a square bracket. And so basically, it's just saying that uh, it's a particular way that every, every uh, parallel process uh, would have access to, and that would make the uh, uh, overall calculation somewhat faster. Well, what is the performance that we get? Uh, this is a, uh, a plot of the, uh, of the time taken a, a measure in seconds versus the number of uh, parallel processes, if you ask, uh, or, or, the, or the number of the parallel processes. And these are uh, three clusters of data points, uh, 2048, 4096, 8192 cube. And in every case, uh, we have a uh, number of uh, particles, 16 million, 64, 256, 
and you can see that uh, 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 the, the cost is proportional to the, uh, to, to the particle count. Of course, this is not the, uh, the, this is not the time required, uh, taken for the DNS calculation itself. This is just the time uh, taken to go over the loop on, on, on the previous slide. And we can see that, well, if the scaling is perfect, uh, so, so the swan scaling is perfect, then every, um, on a log loss plot, it will be uh, inversely proportional, a slope of minus one. One could say, maybe a little surprising, uh, it was surprising at the first time we, uh, well, uh, first time I, I saw this result. Actually, the, uh, the swan scaling is best, 80 92, 92 cube. Most of the, most of the time, people, we, we, uh, we know that the, the scaling will be less, uh, worse and worse uh, as the number of processors increase. But in this case, that's not quite true. In this case, uh, the code happens to be more efficient at the large problem size than at the more modest ones. So, uh, and that requires some analysis. Uh, and one can, and we can think about it in terms of the uh, communication time. The, the more general, the most general case is this. So, now, each subdomain is going to consist of a number of grid cells, n in one direction, n divided by something in the other direction, and as well as the, as the, as the third direction. Communication is going to be, uh, well, for communication, we have to consider the, the cross-sectional area. What is the cross-sectional area of the boundary of that subdomain that, uh, that, uh, 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 that separates from its uh, close neighbors? So, uh, so uh, you, and, and we have uh, four edges of this uh, rectangle. That's why, why we have uh, terms like this here. And cubic points involve the two grid points on each side. Uh, this is because of, this, uh, because of the cubic polynomial. And so the number of, of the probability uh, that some communication will uh, be required can be obtained by this formula. Uh, this is factor four here. This is the volume of the subdomain divided by the area. And this is the number of uh, particles uh, per processor. Uh, P is the number of processors. And, um, but sometimes, uh, uh, well, this, uh, the formula uh, uh, here may not always work because uh, what about if, uh, if n over PC is one? What about if instead of a uh, with the rectangle here, I'm only just only looking at one line, then every processor will require information above and below. So in that case, we actually find that the uh, communication time is proportional uh, to the number of particles and inversely proportional to the number to the number of processors. And that actually require, means that we're going to get get get, get perfect scaling. So in, uh, in, so and this uh, part uh, that's at least part, uh, part explains the, the results that we have. And also, this track of core wave for one is especially efficient when the messages are small. And this is somewhat uh, uh, different from uh, uh, more, more, more common considerations. And what about the particle migrations? Uh, well, the, uh, when a particle migrates from one subdomain to the other, the control uh, or the respons respons responsibility for updating is the new position transfer to the new uh, host M MPI process. And there will be some uh, send and receive uh, operations uh, going on with how many neighbors? So there will be eight of them uh, because uh, if we have, if this is uh, a, a, a uh, this sort of cross section of the subdomain, you're looking at, looking at uh, essentially one on each side because uh, that, well, that's why we have, uh, that, that, why we have eight, eight neighbors. And also we, um, well, there may be a slight, really, uh, slight, uh, degree of imbalance. At, uh, many, well, the idea is that uh, any time step, some processes may have more work to do uh, than the others. But we're helped by the fact that we are simulating homogeneous turbulence and also uh, non-inertial particles. So, to, so the fluid particles are not supposed to accumulate systematically over a period of time, and so, uh, so the degree of imbalance is really small. And there are some factors uh, that we can uh, that would uh, con uh, have an influence on the particle migration. The core number uh, it limits how far a particle can go, and uh, more migrations. Uh, uh, there will be more migration in the domains rotating in one direction, and also, uh, well, we would uh, have to acknowledge that this may be not so efficient uh, for inertial particles or, or brownian particles. We can jump over 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 more, more than one grid space. The overall simulation cost here uh, is 4096 cube and, and 8192 cube, uh, the number of uh, particles uh, uh, going by a factor of four. And you look at the last, um, uh, and let's say we have, 
the largest size, problem size here, the, the number, essentially the particle loops is becoming negligible in, uh, in the course. And scalability does improve with a large problem size. We will assume the number of particles much more than the number of grid points, though. And uh, we are using uh, uh, one-sided communication, uh, which is part of the uh, Fortran standard now. Now, um, let, me, let me turn to the second part of my talk now. Uh, so uh, we talk about mixing uh, in terms of passive scalars. Uh, we are all familiar with this equation. Where on the right hand side, I have taken the, I have take, uh, taken the mean gradient term, uh, uh, essentially mean gradient to be the source of the uh, scalar fluctuations. And uh, we, I think, uh, well, I myself arrived uh, uh, on the conf uh, here only Wednesday. Uh, Wednesday night, I know, I know that my friend Professor Goto has given the talk on, on, on some of the high, uh, uh, some of the pieces of high, of, uh, high speed number mixing, and also Professor Srinivasan is his uh, uh, one hour lecture on Wednesday. Also mentioned some of these concepts, so I'm going to uh, skip forth to the, the Marco uh, uh, issues. So again, uh, I'm showing uh, also uh, this sketch uh, by uh, Professor Goto. And basically, the idea is to uh, demonstrate that the form of the spectrum has very different power laws depending on which uh, scale of uh, which mean number regime uh, we are in. And uh, there have been the DNS the results that have been compared, can be compared with all the of these uh, in all of these regimes. Uh, what is the most important? Uh, what is the most difficult thing to do? I, I think uh, this is still to try to get at the viscous convective range because you will have to have a very high Schmidt number and a high, very high Schmidt number requires that we make the grid spacing very small compared to what we do uh, for the velocity field itself. And uh, I quote here with some certainly a bias uh, for uh, uh, papers that I have uh, uh, written myself. Uh, what have we done uh, for high Schmidt number? Uh, is it the, the, uh, just to emphasize the difficulty, again, every time we are willing to half the number of grid points, uh, half, half the, half the uh, grid spacing, double the number of grid points, the core numbers are, uh, restriction means that we have to double the number of time steps as well. So every time we do that, we, uh, we, uh, we pay 16 times more increase in computational resources. And how much uh, increase in speed number we get? Well, square root of 16 which is four. So how do we go from one to, let's say, 512? That's a long way to go. Um, so what we have to do is to uh, try to get the best parking that we can. Uh, I would insist that we want to have a velocity field, let's say, or let's say, that we, uh, let's say that we insist on a velocity field that has some inertial range characteristics. Okay. Um, so my earlier paper on LM8 definitely is not going to do it. Now I'm 38, not quite either. And we, would, and we would like to have a Schmidt number that's as, as high as possible, comparable to, salin, uh, to uh, salinity in the ocean, which is 700. And uh, we wanted to develop the best algorithm for doing that. And, 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 and of course, get access to the best machine. And, in, in the, uh, and along the way, actually, there is going to be uh, there is some, uh, brief, uh, some, uh, some advance in high performance computing that we have been able to make. So, how do we do this? Uh, um, we, uh, we have a, a problem of uh, very diverse uh, uh, resolution requirements. So we can actually have a velocity field on the coarser grid and a scalar on the finer grid. That's not quite a new idea. And then, uh, for the, uh, and then we have a passive scalar. So the velocity affects the scalar. So how do we, uh, we have to get the velocity over from the coarse grid to the finer grid. We were doing interpolation. And uh, we like to have as high accuracy as possible without, without uh, very heavy communication. And three-dimensional FFT can only give us high accuracy, but it won't answer the second, the, uh, won't answer the second requirement. And so uh, Professor Goto, his, uh, his, his paper, uh, he, he came up with the idea of a hybrid algorithm. Let's use uh, compact boundary differences to obtain the uh, derivatives of the, of, the scalar, of the scalar that's in the abstraction uh, diffusion equation. And, uh, and then it turns out that the, that the communication requirements are actually much less. But we want to, and we want to take it to a big computer, uh, make, it, make it scale very well. We do uh, so-called uh, multi-threading, and we are also have also made some progress in using uh, graphical processor units. So we, first, uh, we have uh, a, uh, what we call a dual uh, uh, communicator algorithm. 
So these are, these are actually the same grid. Uh, well, uh, physically, they are, uh, they are in the same position. But what we're going to do is say, um, let's say the certain number of grid points for the scalar to the velocity to be eight. And so uh, the workload on the final grid obviously is much heavier. And we have uh, two separate groups of processes. One will be field in number. We will take care of the velocity field. But of course, uh, um, well, let's say that uh, the, you consider the number of lines here, you say, suggest that, that we don't have very fine divisions of the, of the grid. And for the scalar field, we have a finer grid. grid. Uh, we, we, have a, uh, we, have an, uh, we have another set of processes. Most of the processes will, will, will be working on the scalar. So, and this is the passive scalar. So the velocity has to, information has to go from, uh, from, the, uh, uh, from one, one communicator to another. Uh, one group of processes to another, we, uh, and uh, this is what we call a, a essentially one-way intercommunicator transfer. And we can, and one of the ideas that comes up from this is sorry, the velocity, uh, some of the processes are carried out by this group of MPI processes, and that the other group, they can well be overlapping uh, with each other. They can essentially be done at the same time. And that is what, that's the beginning of the idea of, uh, of trying to make the, make the calculation faster. And here's, a, uh, here's an informal flow chart. Uh, on the left-hand side, all the operations on the velocity field. On the right-hand side, all the uh, operations on, on the scalar field. The, uh, the Epsilon diffusion equation requires a first and second derivative. So this is where you will use, uh, use the CCD, uh, the compound difference, the, the, the combined, com combined compound difference, combined in the sense that we're getting the first and second derivatives at the same time. And there's some transfer operation uh, the velocity field has to go there, then we have to determine, uh, de determine the time step size as well. Um, and then uh, um, what kinds of operations are actually required? Uh, the CCD routines uh, require solution of a block uh, system of uh, a block triadiagonal uh, equation, block in the sense of two by two because we're getting uh, two derivatives at, 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 at the same time. And it turns out that uh, by an algorithm developed by another scientist in Japan, the, the solution of this equation can be done without any transpose. We don't have to, like the two-dimensional decomposition for the velocity field, we, don't have, we, have, we have to do uh, transport this way, uh, that way, and that way, and so forth. We don't have to do that anymore. And that, that, is, uh, that is going to save us a substantial, uh, a substantial amount of time. We do have some communication, the so-called gauge layers, uh, com which come in for, com uh, for, co for finite different schemes. We do have to uh, pack the messages. Uh, we have to uh, collect uh, data from different parts, uh, different parts of the computer memory, uh, and then send it off. And then uh, we receive data, some data, and then we have to unpack it into the, uh, into the appropriate positions. And uh, on, on CPU-only machines, what can we do to make the calculation faster? First, we could say, while communication, if communication cannot be avoided, can it be done in a non-blocking manner? That is to say, let's say that well, many of us are capable of, say, hearing somebody talk uh, while typing uh, on the computer while doing something else. So can we, can, uh, rather than, well, this can be, this is what we call, uh, what we call non-blocking non communication, as long as we are not operating on the, on the information that is still incomplete, still in the process of coming in. We can also uh, carry out uh, computation in one direction while communicating for another, because uh, Derivatives in different directions are essentially, uh, essentially decoupled from each other. We use the feature OpenMP uh, locks. What is OpenMP in case you're not familiar with this? This is a, uh, this is a, a very common uh, uh, software library for uh, essentially shared memory computing. Okay. So uh, most, as I said, we have one node, 32 cores. Can, how can we make the 32 cores uh, essentially uh, uh, function as one, one single unit? And we can also dedicate some of the uh, one thread to communication. All the others will, will be computing. And that's what the idea of uh, so-called um, open MP nest parallelism. Uh, uh, we have a paper uh, we, we, where we have, all, uh, we have the details now. Uh, what about the performance of the code? Uh, here we have uh, data points, 1,024, 2,048, 496, 8192. We have also tested 16K cube. Um, we can see that the, uh, the scalability is perfect. Of the smaller problem sizes, the larger problem sizes, we start to have more problems. Uh, we lost sight of some of these uh, data points not falling uh, onto the uh, dashed lines that we have drawn. Nevertheless, uh, 
for uh, our, for our, our production our production problem size is um, is here. This is just uh, for the uh, CCD routines. So we start off with this uh, 0.936 seconds uh, divided, uh, and we move it down to 0.616 seconds, about 40% improvement or so. And uh, we uh, are strong in uh, scaling, we're scaling are pretty good if you look at just the data points uh, marked by, by the cyan symbols. Right? And um, I think the percentage uh, uh, that I call I can consider to be relatively high. What about uh, the DNS code itself? Uh, then uh, we have also the, the symbols in Cyan. Also, they are very good. Uh, good. Uh, they, uh, that's the best that we could do. Uh, but, well, interpolation, the idea of interpolating the velocity field from the core screen to the final grid does take considerable time. 25%, uh, but uh, just uh, uh, in the last 24 hours, uh, my, one of my co authors, uh, Matthew Clay, he said that he has found a way of, of making that part go faster. Uh, don't have the, date, uh, the new num uh, points yet, but then things are going to get be getting better. Um, okay. So, uh, what is the future look, uh, going to look like? Uh, I think I have. Okay, I don't. I'm not uh, having a lot of information about uh, about uh, GPU. So this is the second last slide, as you can see. Um, so in the U.S., uh, for the last few years, uh, the fastest machine has uh, available to the academic community at least is a 27 petaflop, quite XK. Well, yes, that's a, that's a so-called XK7. The XK7 has uh, nodes uh, which are all fitted with GPU. So one uh, one uh, one unspoken rule uh, for getting allocation of this machine is that you have got to be sure that you can use uh, GPUs. Otherwise, no matter how excellent the science will be very difficult. And uh, we have figured that out. And, uh, and by next year, they will have a machine five times faster than this one. It will be an IBM Power 9 with six CPUs per, 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 per CPU. Was just, just one now. And, and the hardware is going up to extra scale with the Department of Energy, uh, two, 2020 something. This number, may, I hope it's a small integer, maybe two or three. And we are, uh, the community is moving towards, uh, towards uh, many core machines. Uh, they, uh, there's, uh, by, by, uh, they, they also the also nice landing platform by Intel, 70 cores for uh, hardware stress per core. So sometimes it's a, uh, a substantial, uh, it takes a substantial amount of effort to try to make uh, one our code efficiently on these machines. And also the, uh, well, the, uh, the CPU, uh, essentially the, the GPUs to give us the promise of fast computation and no power. The question is, of course, the other thing is, what is the software ready? I should say that on the 27 part of our machine, if, I, if you want to code that, uh, where that, uh, that barely passes one part of our, you're supposed to be, you're said to be doing relatively well. Right? So, and, uh, so this is a, there's a substantial challenge of the software, and, uh, and we have to use algorithms that communicate either less or communicate faster. So the last slide here, I, will, uh, I think, I hope all of you would agree that uh, turbulence, the turbulent mixing, all kinds of turbulence, not just the simple kinds of, uh, that, that I've been working on, uh, essentially grand challenge uh, problems in high-performance computing. We do face, however, as a matter of fact, fierce competition from other fields of science, from those who, uh, who predict uh, uh, natural disasters, who, uh, who have worked with biomedical uh, uh, applications uh, in California, earthquakes, uh, right, as, well as, as well as in Japan. And so we have to be, uh, we, we have to be very competitive, and uh, we, we cannot do so be without being active in responding to changes in the high-performance high uh, computing landscape. Otherwise, uh, the, those advances will essentially be leaving us behind. And we have a big problem in how do we sort the data. We, uh, we, we can generate um, petabytes of data, okay? The one day, if I lose time on these centers, I don't know where to put it. Now, that's one question that I, can, uh, that I have no idea about, honestly. Um, but if we can show that there's a wider community who, uh, who can use the data to do useful things, then maybe we'll, there will be some breakthrough somehow. As for the uh, future science outlook for turbulence, uh, we're going, I think we all want to look, uh, go, go towards it, uh, 
larger problems, this may be uh, more geometrically more complex or physically more complex. Let's say, what about your active scalar? If you have a uh, atmospheric boundary layer and so forth, and we have to make sure that we, uh, well, I think we, we have to look at the resolution effects uh, more rigorously than before. And finally, we just need to build a sustainable computational laboratory. But by that, I don't mean a computer room, but that's basically a, essentially a virtual laboratory, if you will. All the data sets, how do we, how do we, how can we sustain them? How do we make sure that they are not, that they, they, will, be, they, will, not, they will not be lost? So, so that uh, the wider community can actually benefit from the simulation. Thank you very much.